Well, I know that we finished up a few weeks back a series on how God views politics, but I'm serious after the events of this week in Washington, D.C. Maybe we need to go back and play that again. There's nothing about the events leading up to the inauguration of Joe Biden that leaves any of us feeling like we don't need a shower. Sometimes how you look at things can change everything. And God help us, we need to fix our focus. There's a story about an elderly couple sitting on a couch, and she takes off his glasses, looks at his face, holds it in her hand, and smiles and says, you know, without your glasses on, I can still see that young man who walked down the aisle with me so many years ago and said, I do. He looks back at her and smiles and says, yeah, you look pretty good without my glasses on too. I'm not sure that came across exactly like he intended. The result of that makes everybody cringe. But honestly, there's a lot after 2020 that makes us cringe because of how out of focus things have gotten. I promise you just seeing hashtag justice and hearing chants of no justice, no peace just makes me flinch. Images of riots in response to the perception of police brutality and the loss of life are awful. Government mandated shutdowns, the fiasco of filing for unemployment online, waiting for checks to come that don't come until after you've already been back to work. The anger over perceived injustice is a dangerous weapon that's used to manipulate the mob. I have no interest in telling you what to think about all of those issues, but I do want to point you in the direction of how to fix your focus. We'll have to get past the mental images of courtrooms and lawyers and black robes and gavels and juries, but I think that's what Micah had in mind when he tried to impress upon us the high priority that justice has with God. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, he says, The Lord has shown you what is good. He has told you what is required of you. You must act with justice. You must love to show mercy. You must be humble as you live in the sight of your God. In the name of justice, we tend to focus on punishing the guilty. But God's focus is on protecting the innocent. That's quite a contrast. But that was the complaint that God held against his people in Micah chapter 6. They assumed that as long as they went to worship, they could treat people any way they wanted to. Remember the backstory from Micah. He's watched the nation of God's people disintegrate around him. Again, this sounds like something that is a response to the events of this week. As punishment for ignoring him, God sent another enemy nation to take away their country from them. It had already happened to the ten northern tribal states known as Israel. And Micah had seen that happen in his own lifetime. And as a result of that war in that neighboring country with their family, men died, women were widowed. Children were orphaned, and they fled as refugees into the neighboring country of Judah with nothing more than what they could carry. Desperate people can easily be taken advantage of because they have no other choice to survive. One person's misfortune, unfortunately, is seen as another person's opportunity, and that's exactly what Micah saw play out in his life. In Micah chapter 2, verse 2, this accusation from God. You covet a man's fields and houses and take them by violence. You cheat families out of their home, their lands, and their inheritance. In chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. Listen to my message, you rulers of Israel. You hate justice and you twist the truth. 
you make cruelty and murder a way of life in Jerusalem. Ironically, Jerusalem was the center of their worship. So where worship should have been happening, cruelty and murder became a way of life. He says, your leaders accept bribes for dishonest decisions. Your priests and prophets teach and preach, but only for money. And then you say, the Lord is on our side. No harm will come to us. In Micah chapter 7, verse 3, this accusation from God. Your officials and judges alike demand bribes or kickbacks. Again, sounds like Washington, doesn't it? The people with influence get whatever they want. And together they scheme how to twist justice. You see, God's focus is on justice because it's a reflection of His character. In Psalm 33, verse 5, it says, The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of His love. God's focus has always been pretty clear about what justice represents. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, he says, You must learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of the orphan, fight for the rights of widows. And in Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9, he says, Defend those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Defend the rights of the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. The Hebrew word for justice is referred to as mishpat. Simply stated, it means making wrong things right. That's about as, that's about as basic as you can make it. If something's wrong, then let's make it right. It sounds like something you'd tell your kids, right? No wonder it was what God's instruction was for his children. Preacher and author Tim Keller wrote a rather in-depth article called Secular Justice Theories. If you're having trouble getting to sleep at night, I guarantee you that that will help. It's pretty in-depth in its philosophy and theology, but let me summarize the spectrum of what he says. <clears throat> The theories of secular justice range from, on the one hand, individualism. That was promoted by a guy named John Locke, who said, you are entirely the product of your own individual choices. In other words, the future is entirely up to you, no one else. On the other end of the spectrum, though, you have collectivism. If that sounds familiar, it may be because you've heard a guy named Karl Marx promote that. His perspective was, you are entirely the product of the social structures that are set in place. You might even say, you didn't build that to a business owner. In between those two extremes of individualism and collectivism, there are several different markers. Libertarianism. Justice is all about giving the individual equal freedom and rights. Liberalism is the next stop on the march to the other end of the spectrum with the perspective that justice is all about fairness and will force fairness by redistributing both money and power. A third step on that spectrum is utilitarianism, where justice is all about happiness. You might even call it utopianism. It's a removal of all sources of pain and suffering under the conviction that nothing bad should ever happen to anyone. And finally, you've got postmodernism, where justice is all about power, taking power from the institutions that have it and redistributing that power to the individual, power to the people type of thing. They all have their merits, but they also have their flaws because, you see, they are secular theories about how to bring about justice. For the libertarian, it leaves out the aspect of the individual sin factor. How can justice be achieved when I'm a sinner at heart? 
liberalism, forcing equality by removing the blessings of others have, you also remove their motivation to excel or work. The pilgrims learned that when they nearly starved to death that first year here in the United States. Utilitarianism, where happiness is the objective, the only problem with that is not everybody's standard of happiness is the same. It's completely subjective and therefore elusive and never able to be achieved on a widespread basis. Postmodernism, power to the people. <laughs> the only problem with that is the people become the oppressors once they are empowered. You see, the only principles of God that can, only the principles of God can fix our focus on justice. It's not your favorite news channel. It's not your favorite blogger. It's not your favorite talk show host. Only God can refocus us on justice. Let me share a few principles with you to help that happen. First of all, the number one principle is this. We are all made in the image of God. You remember the story. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, and so God created mankind in his own image. He created them male and female. Long before there was a constitution, long before there was a United States of America, God created all men and women equally in his image. That's why we all matter to God. Because regardless of our differences, we're all created in his image. The church teaches this from the earliest days of Sunday school and VBS, doesn't it? When we teach the little kids the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children. All the children of the world. And what's next? Red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. Because Jesus loves the little children of the world. Since we're all made in his image, we all share equally in the responsibility of his standard of justice for the world. The world that he loves. And that's the second principle of how to let God focus us on justice. We all share equal responsibility for justice. Individually. It is my individual responsibility to see justice is done. <laughs> it wasn't too long after the story of the Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden when it talks of their grown sons, Cain and Abel. And of course, because of jealousy and anger and frustration, one of them killed the other. And when God confronted him in Genesis 4 verse 9, he says, where's your brother? He says, well, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And when God confronted him with the, brother, or with the murder of his brother Abel, Cain's response was met with a very clear, yes, as a matter of fact, you are responsible for him. God has expected his people to accept a shared responsibility to provide justice for all, all throughout history, all throughout the Bible. It doesn't take much of a look at the Old Testament to remember these principles. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it provides instruction that every third year, they were to give alms or gifts to the poor. Gleaning laws were set in place that would dictate that a portion of their crop be left at the edges of their field come harvest time so that those who were walking by or the poor would have something to keep them from starving. And even though it sounds a little bizarre in our culture, childless widows were the responsibility of his brother, the deceased brother. It was his responsibility to give his sister-in-law children so that she would have an inheritance and be able to claim her rightful place in the community. Rape laws were put in place to protect the rights of women. Even fair wages were expected to be honored. Not a minimum wage, but a fair wage. So that hired servants weren't abused. 
or grow to be resentful. Bribery was prohibited. It was referred to as usury, or excuse me, high interest rates were referred to as usury, and that was outlawed as well, so as not to take advantage of the desperate and the poor. The bribery, that was just to ensure justice for all, not just the rich. And finally, something called the Year of Jubilee was established so that every 50 years, all debts would be forgiven. All slaves would be set free. And all property would be returned to the original owner so that it would maintain part of the family heritage and inheritance. Here's a priority number three for helping us to fix our focus on biblical principles of God. We are individually responsible for justice as well. Yes, we have a shared collective responsibility, but we also have an individual responsibility. God acknowledges that sometimes poverty can be the result of individual failure because of laziness or drunkenness. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, he drives people to look at the ant and learn from them. He says, ants have no ruler, no boss, no leader, but in the summer, ants store up their food so that when winter comes, there's plenty to eat. The point that he makes is that we should learn from someone who doesn't have somebody forcing them to do what they don't feel like doing that day because he knows his survival depends on his own hard work and preparation. A few verses later in Proverbs 6 and verses 9 through 15, God there warns about how too much sleeping and too little working or deceiving others to get ahead is something that he frowns on as well. And maybe the more familiar passage in the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Now you may not recognize the location of that verse, but you will recognize what it says. We've also given you this rule that if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. You see the uniqueness of God's principles of justice? It includes a collective shared responsibility to take care of each other, but it also admonishes the individual to accept individual responsibility to take care of himself. That brings us to a fourth principle, and that is that we're to provide justice for the powerless. Some people, God recognizes, need protection from predators. People like widows, orphans, the poor, and even immigrants. God repeatedly emphasizes that these groups of people, the widows, the orphans, the poor, and the immigrants, will need special protection of a justice judicial system. The Bible actually refers to God as the defender of the poor. But it rarely, no, it never refers to God as the defender of the rich. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse 10, it says, Do not oppress the widows, the orphans, the foreigners, and the poor, and do not scheme against them. In other words, don't take advantage of these people who've lost the advantage of life. In Deuteronomy 27, verse 19, whoever deprives foreigners, orphans, and widows of justice will be cursed. You see, our own experience in history has proven that justice is not always equally distributed in culture. You can only imagine how bizarre this principle may have sounded to people who equated wealth with the blessing of God. And poverty, sickness, death, and misfortune was clearly, in their mind, proof of God's displeasure for them. And yet God challenges us to fix our focus when it comes to how we view the most vulnerable among us. It wasn't the high-ranking, wealthy male of society that God looked out for, but it was the poor. God wants us to actually become advocates for those whose circumstances have left them at a disadvantage. Justice demands that we get involved when disengagement actually feels safer. There was this illustration in a place where I went to school, actually, Lubbock, Texas. They have most of their drainage system above ground with the streets crowned in the middle and then ditches at each curb. 
during a particularly heavy rainstorm, the streets and the ditches were flooded. If there was an underpass, it would flood as well. A guy in a lifted four-wheel drive pickup truck pulls up to an underpass that's clearly flooded with water. There's a car stranded down there. The, the water is nearly halfway up to her windows on her door. The woman has crawled out of her car. She's standing there beside her car, has her skirt lifted up above her knees, just looking around, trying to figure out what to do next. The guy rolls down his window and calls out to her, ma'am, do you need help? How can I help you, he says. She calls back, you can't do anything from there. I need you here. And that's just it. Justice demands we get in the flood. Justice demands we get in the mud. Justice demands that we get where they are when we'd really rather just stay high and dry and safe. That brings us to the fifth principle and the last one. Justice requires reconciliation. It's the vision of Jesus to reach all people with the justice of God. It was in John's testimony of the life and ministry of Jesus that he mentions in chapter 4, verse 4, that Jesus deliberately chose to go through Samaria on his way back to Galilee. His story tells us of Jesus' now famous encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. And his respect for her was shocking. It says in verse 9 of John 4, her response to Jesus, I'm surprised that you would ask me for a drink. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Jews would have nothing to do with Samaritans. And it was totally out of character for men to talk to women in public. And yet, justice requires that we reach out to anyone. The Apostle Paul would instruct the Galatians, who were in a huge fight over ethnicity in Galatians 3, 27 and 28. You were all baptized into Christ, and so you were all clothed with Christ. Note the emphasis on all. This shows that you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Greek, a slave or free, a male or female. Do you hear the universal reconciliation that's offered in Christ? He says, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's the gospel message. It offered justice for all without regard for racism, sexism, victimization of slavery. It didn't matter. The gospel message would set anyone and everyone free and make us one in Christ. That was in keeping with the last words of Jesus in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. When his instructions to his followers were this, As you go throughout the world, tell everyone the good news, and whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever. Not just the rich, not just the entitled, not just the educated. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. That was also the message of the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost when the church found its beginning in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. With many nations from all over the world present, Peter says to them, Repent, change your hearts and lives, and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise of the Spirit of God and the forgiveness of their sins. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away. It is for anyone that the Lord our God calls to himself. There will never be liberty for all without justice for all. Especially this week. I believe our country is experiencing outrage fatigue, where we're just done. We've been force-fed a daily overdose of injustice so that eventually we just get emotionally ready to unplug from it all. We, just, we stop listening to the news. We can't take it anymore. It's kind of like, you know, when they bring out another pie after Thanksgiving dinner, 
at about two o'clock in the afternoon. You couldn't have another piece if you wanted it. It's impossible for people to sustain a high level of intense anger for day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. Eventually, we lose the ability and the desire to be outraged any longer. Now, let's see. Whose advantage would that give the opportunity to? To get away with anything. If all I do is scream at you long enough, you'll stop listening. And then you'll stop paying attention. And then I can do whatever I want to do. But instead, he says, we possess the Spirit of God. Injustice creates a degree of holy outrage in us because we possess God's Spirit. And consequently, like the old song, we're not going to take it anymore the same type result happens and people decide we've got to do something. That was certainly the case out in California where they've had a lockdown of churches since last March. I might add, again, totally against the Constitution that prohibits the free exercise of religion. But that California church grew tired of being locked down by the state while strip clubs were allowed to continue to operate as essential to free speech. So finally, one pastor, Jurgen Mathesius, at the Awakened Church in San Diego decided, you know what, that's it. If strip clubs are going to be allowed to stay open and churches are going to stay shut down, we're rebranding. We're no longer the Awakened Church. We are now to be known as the Awakened Family Friendly Strip Club. Everybody come. And boy, did they that next Sunday. And so he welcomed them to the Awakened Family Friendly Strip Club where he says, we strip off the devil and his hold and power over us and the authority over our people's lives. Yeah, insert the disco ball and the glitter and everybody had a good laugh. Gee, imagine this. They still got taken to court, but they won. As God's church, we have the opportunity to either be a witness or to lose our witness. We must make sure that our allegiance is still to the kingdom of God and not to a particular party agenda. As people who have the heart and spirit of God himself, we must stand for what is right and what is wrong and not what is wrong. We must not stand for the right or the left. We must stand for God and His righteous justice. It's right to speak out on behalf of the 300,000 plus babies who are aborted every year by Planned Parenthood. It's right to speak out against sex trafficking in Ohio where we rank fifth in the nation. One of our cities, Toledo, is ranked fourth in the nation. Just last October, hundreds were arrested in an undercover sting here in our state of Ohio for sex trafficking. Over 200 kids in Ohio were rescued. The average age when most of them were kidnapped and trafficked, 13. It's right to speak out against veterans getting stuck in government bureaucracy and its nightmare. It's right to speak out against child abuse in our community where over 70 kids went into protective services in just last year, 2020. 70 kids in our county were being so abused by their own family that they had to be removed from their own family. Only God can fix our focus on justice. And that happens when we commit ourselves to making wrong things right. What does justice look like at MCC? Well, it looks like over $4,500 it's raised for benevolence and support of individual families just in the last few months. We're not a congregation of thousands. You know that. 
It's monthly support for the Hope Center for those who are disadvantaged in our community. It's monthly support for the New Path Pregnancy Resource Center for those who find themselves facing unexpected and unprepared for pregnancies. When a prisoner's kids still have an amazing Christmas morning, it's because of an angel tree in our lobby that you so generously snapped up every option for their gift. And when a COVID lockdown has left someone without a paycheck and facing repossession, justice at MCC looks like helping them out, not only with a generous gift financially, but also giving them a job that you're willing to pay them for to tide them over in the meantime. When a yard gets raked or a drive gets shoveled or a ride gets shared, that's justice. And when someone says, hey, I don't know your name. Let me introduce myself. Do you mind if I sit near you? That's justice. You see, we look for God's perspective of justice, not just a secular theory about justice. We all have equal value because we're made in the image of God, so we all deserve justice. We all have a corporate responsibility together as a church to share together and provide justice for everyone. We also have individual responsibility to provide justice for ourselves, and we're to provide justice through the protection of the powerless. And we know that God desires reconciliation for all people everywhere when he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. There's a day coming when justice will cover the earth. Micah chapter 4, verse 3, says it this way, the Lord will settle the arguments between powerful nations. Boy, I'd love to be around to see that. They will pound their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You may not know anything about plowing. You may not know anything about pruning. Just understand this. What they used to use to destroy each other will now become tools for productivity. They'll never again train for war. They'll never again attack one another. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity for there will be nothing to fear. Justice reigns supreme. Only God knows what impact this message is having on your heart. Only God knows the way that he's been opening your eyes to see things differently than you've ever seen them before and to hear things differently than you've ever been hearing them lately. Only God knows how his spirit is working in you, on you, and through you. But that's only if you let him. Fix your focus on His justice.